This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. So, you like cars, do ya? I feel like Gran Turismo as a series really puts a person's automotive passion to the test. Because you might like cars, but by playing through a Gran Turismo game, you will come to understand if you truly love cars. There's no doubt about it, the cars really are the heart of Gran Turismo. That's why I've already made a couple of videos covering some of the most interesting and noteworthy models to have featured in these games. But alongside the most meme-worthy cars, and the models that live in infamy amongst the GT community, I think we should really take a look at the cars that Gran Turismo itself thrust into the spotlight. Machines that were once doomed to obscurity, but thanks to these games, have in some cases become household names. These are the cars we'll be talking about, and not just about how they appeared in Gran Turismo, but also their often fascinating real-life stories as well. When talking about obscure and close to forgotten cars in this series, there's no way that we could avoid talking about Gran Turismo 2. Of course, the influx of international brands played a big part here. We could mention cars from the likes of Vector or Venturi, for example. But the car I want to highlight is actually still a Japanese domestic model. Tomikaira is a Japanese tuning company that appeared in the mid-80s, and became reasonably well known for their work on various Nissan and Subaru models in particular. A few of these tuned models are even featured in GT2, but alongside those were a handful of original Tomikaira sports cars. Work first began on a sports car in 1992, and by 1995, the Tomikaira ZZ was shown publicly for the first time. It was a 180 horsepower, lightweight, mid-engine sports car built to rival the brand new Lotus Elise. Or at least that's what most people assume. It's often forgotten, but the ZZ was actually in development before the Elise, with both being unveiled at roughly the same time. Also, despite being produced solely for the Japanese market, the ZZ was designed and built in the UK, with many former Lotus engineers being involved. There was also an upgraded ZZS model, which boasted just shy of 200 horsepower. This version is the one that would go on to feature in GT2. And in GT2, the car is pretty solid. It weighs less than 700 kilos, so its 200 horsepower does feel like a bit more in practice. That said, if you still want to upgrade it further, it can top out at 279 horsepower. But with each of these videos I make about the cars of Gran Turismo, they always seem to come back to one topic. The cheating AI opponents in GT2. And interestingly, the Tomikaira ZZS is actually one of the worst cheaters that you can find. To demonstrate this, we should take a look at the pure sports car cup event where it sometimes appears. With the ZZS, this is not a case of it breaking the event restrictions, but rather breaking the tuning limits. As a reminder, the ZZS can only be tuned up to a maximum of 279 horsepower by the player. Yet in race 1, the opponent ZZS will have 292 horsepower. In race 2, it'll have 340 horsepower, and in race 3, 487 horsepower. So yeah, some classic GT2 shenanigans. Anyway, why I chose the ZZS in particular over other similarly obscure cars from GT2, like the Tom's Angel T01, or the two other unique Tommy Kyra models, is because of what happened after GT2. The switch to the all-new PlayStation 2 for Gran Turismo 3 heralded much more detailed models, requiring much more time to create. This resulted in the Great Car List Purge. The total number of cars was trimmed from well over 600 in GT2, down to just 180 in GT3. But amazingly, 
Despite pretty much all of the other obscure and low volume cars from GT2 not making the cuts, the ZZS did. At this point, the car was no longer even being made, with just over 200 models being produced from 1996 to 2000. And yet, here it was, alongside the road car version of its supposed successor, the ZZ2, which never made it into production. And that solidified it in the series, all the way up until Gran Turismo Sport in 2017. Frankly, there was a really good chance that had the ZZS not been chosen to return in GT3, it never would have featured in the series ever again. And to be honest, a timeline where the ZZS was not included in GT3 to GT6 is not a timeline that I want to live in. But regardless, when it comes to the real car, we're not done quite yet. The ZZ was briefly revived in 2002 under the Leading Edge Sports Car Company. After Tommy Kyra ended production of the ZZ, the designs were sold off and the car continued to be produced in the UK for a few more years in the early 2000s. There were actually two versions, the 190RT and the 240RT, with the number denoting the rough horsepower figure. The ZZ also acted as a basis for another car, the ASL Garaya. This car would also feature in Gran Turismo starting with GT4, but again sadly never made it into production. And finally, I should also mention the second generation ZZ. Yes, that's right, in 2015, the Tommy Kyra ZZ received a sequel. It was produced jointly with Green Lord Motors, and took the form of an EV producing 300 horsepower from a single electric motor. Whilst it does have a shape vaguely similar with the original ZZ, its design is actually heavily based on the ZZ2 road car prototype. Which is awesome, because I personally think that was one of the best looking cars ever designed. Also, a modified version of the car was planned to appear at the 2020 Pikes Peak Hill Climb, but this was sadly aborted due to obvious reasons. Even still, it should be remembered for having one of the strangest rear wing placements of any car ever made. So, that's the full legacy of the Tommy Kyra ZZ, a car which became well loved across the world. So what I'm going to do now is give my opinion on which GT game I believe the ZZS was truly at its peak. You could argue for GT2, its first ever appearance or GT6, where it was a very competitive car at certain performance point levels, just like the ZZ2. Possibly even GT5, which was the only game in which the ZZS was ever a prize car, given out for getting all golds on the B license. But for me, peak ZZS has to be found in GT3. I think the decision to include the car in GT3 at all was inspired, and it feels like this game is the point where the ZZS really started to show its potential, as it's able to outperform far more powerful rivals. In all, it served as a quirky and unique alternative to the Lotus Elise, and with so few cars to choose from within the arena of ultralight sports cars in GT3, you really appreciate each of them even more. And for me, that's really what makes the difference for the ZZS in GT3 versus any of the other games it appeared in. For our next entry, let's hop over to Gran Turismo 4. When it comes to the cars, GT4 is somewhat similar to GT2. They both represented the second GT game of their respective console, and as such, were able to build on top of the previous entry by adding far more contents. In the end, the game launched with about 720 cars total, including plenty of new additions. In this sense, it's not surprising that this won't be the last time I mention GT4 in this video. The Hommel Berlinette is an almost perfect example of an obscure car which debuted in GT4. From its looks, to its performance, to even its name, it all just screams low volume sports car. But do you know anything about the real Hommel Berlinette? Yeah, I thought not. Originally unveiled in 1994, the Berlinette was the brainchild of Michel Hommel, a former French racing driver and owner of a publishing empire. 
The story goes that Hommel, lamenting the lack of French sports cars at the time, asked the readers of his car magazine what their ideal sports car would look like. The response he got was for something along the lines of the original Alpine A110. Small, light, and rear-engined. So, that's what he made. With the exception of the rear-engine part. Because in 1994, the mid-engined Hommel Berlinette Echappement was launched. In case you're wondering, Echappement means exhaust, and was actually the name of Hommel's magazine. The car was in essence a racer for the road, as it featured a roll cage, harnesses, and very few luxuries to speak of. There was even a track-only version known as the Barquette, which had its roof removed entirely. But this early version of the car probably looks a bit unfamiliar, and that's because it received a fairly major revision in 1999 to make the Berlinette RS. This version had its power upped from 155 horsepower to 167, as well as replacing the front and rear lights with new rounded ones. It's also worth mentioning that there was a restyled Berlinette Echappement shown off in 1997 by Sparrow, a Swiss engineering and design house created at the request of Michel Hommel. The Berlinette RS is the version that would appear in GT4, but there was later an updated RS2 model boasting 195 horsepower. The sad irony of this car is that by the time that GT4 actually came out, the Berlinette was already dead. It finished production at the end of 2003, and although there were rumours about it being revived by some Chinese investors, these came to naught. In terms of how this car appeared in Gran Turismo, there isn't too much to say about it. The Berlinette is one of those cars in which you could play through GT4 entirely and not even notice it was in the game. It wasn't given out as a prize car, and although it had decent performance, was quite overpriced for what it was, so there wasn't much reason to ever use it. But you could come up against the Berlinette in the Championship for French Cars, in which case it's actually one of the toughest opponents you'll find. The real-life Berlinette was designed for racing after all, so I guess that's not too surprising considering its competition. Anyway, here's some more interesting things about Michel Hommel. Did you know that he was the man responsible for bringing Bugatti back to Le Mans in 1994? He commissioned a Bugatti EB110 to be built to GT1 regulations and ran the car under his own name. But unfortunately, it crashed out with less than an hour to go after a tyre failure. Still, at least it performed better than his next attempt in 1995. He commissioned an entirely new car to be built, this time an Aston Martin DB7 with a 6.3 litre V8. But his team failed to qualify for the race entirely. Anyway, back to the topic of the Berlinette. It featured in GT4, GT5, and GT6, but which game do I choose as its peak? Honestly, I would have to say GT5. And really, that's for one specific reason. In GT5, this car is granted as a prize for winning the World Compact Car Race event in A-Spec. Given that this is a level 1 event, and your opponents aren't particularly tough, it can be done very early in the game. This makes the Berlinette a very good, borderline broken prize car to be getting at this point in the career. If you have memories of driving this car in Gran Turismo, more likely than not, this would have been on GT5, given just how easy it was to obtain. But not only was it easy to obtain, it was also really useful. It was a solid choice for a number of events in the beginner and amateur league and depending on your own skill, maybe even one or two in the professional league when fully tuned. Maybe it is a bit of an over-exaggeration to say that the Hommel Berlinette was made famous by Gran Turismo, but there's no doubt that it has been far more well-remembered because of it. And thanks to GT5, it even managed to have its own day in the sun. You know what everyone loves about modern Gran Turismo? Really expensive cars. As in like cars costing tens of millions of credits that you have to grind for weeks for, which aren't really that good or can even be used for much in the game. Who doesn't enjoy that? 
But seriously, GT7 wasn't the first Gran Turismo to have insanely expensive cars. We need to turn to GT5 to find that. Before then, the most expensive cars you could find would normally be around 2 or 3 million credits, with the ultra prestigious vintage models often instead being given out as prizes. But starting with GT5, there were a handful of models costing up to 20 million credits, which was also the maximum amount of credits that you could have at any one time. Our next entry is one of these 20 million credit cars. GT5 introduced three 1960s Le Mans prototypes, the Ferrari 330 P4, Ford GT40 Mark IV, and the Jaguar XJ13. Now both the Ford and Ferrari were already very well known thanks to their respective brands' fierce rivalry at the time, but the Jag stood out as a bit of an outsider. And this is because it never actually raced. Constructed in 1966, the XJ13 was intended to compete in the top prototype category alongside the aforementioned Ford and Ferrari. But by the time it was completed, it was already seen as obsolete when compared to its hypothetical rivals. The car was tested on two occasions in 1967, first at the Mirror Test Track and secondly at Silverstone, where its drivers reported its inherent oversteer characteristics. The car was then shelved before finally being seen publicly at Mirror in 1971, on a promotional shoot for the Series 3 E-Type. But unfortunately, the car, which was being driven by Jaguar test driver Norman Dewis at the time, suffered a tyre failure at around 140 miles an hour and crashed heavily, almost destroying it completely. Although the driver was miraculously unharmed. The damaged car was stored for close to two years before being fully restored and shown off in 1973. Fast forward to 2010 and the car would make its first ever video game appearance in GT5, shown off alongside what would have been its contemporary rivals back in the day, had it not been canned. In GT5 there is even a trophy titled Dream Race, in which you must win a race with either the Ferrari, Ford or Jag, with the other two cars present. Funnily enough, there is also an achievement in GT7 called Three Legendary Cars, which requires you to own these same three cars, although the trophy's description is quite vague and misleading. Now here's something interesting. The car in Gran Turismo is of course based on the rebuilt XJ13, but did you know that the original pre-Mirror Crash car was slightly different? Firstly, the wheel design was changed. This was because the wheels were damaged beyond repair in the accident, and the patterns which were used to make them had been thrown out. Also, the repaired car featured flared wheel arches, which the original didn't have. This was done to mimic what the car would have looked like had it actually competed at Le Mans, as wider arches would have been needed to fit wider tyres. Interestingly, there are some replicas of the XJ13 in its original pre-crash design. So how did this extremely elusive one-off prototype make its way into Gran Turismo in the first place? Well, the real XJ13 appeared at the 2009 Goodwood Festival of Speed, and, as luck would have it, so did Gran Turismo series producer Kazunori Yamauchi. He even drove the car himself, and it seems likely that from this came an agreement to scan the car and put it into the upcoming Gran Turismo 5. What's quite funny is that on Wikipedia, the main image on the article for the XJ13 is actually Kaz driving it at Goodwood in 2009. So, the XJ13 featured in GT5, GT6, as DLC in GT Sport, and now in GT7. But which game was its peak? Well, I think this one is fairly obvious, but again, I'm going for GT5, its debut. This is probably when the car was most relevant and had the biggest spotlight placed on it. Unlike its fellow 20 million credit contemporaries, the XJ13 can also be won as a prize car from the Indy 500 A-Spec Endurance race, so it's arguably the most attainable of the three. It features as an opponent in a handful of events in GT5, most notably the Historic Car Cup, but also even in the Gran Turismo World Championship, where it can be a fairly tough rival. There was also the XJ13 Chrome Line, 
which was a version of the car with a special livery that could only be obtained by taking part in a Facebook minigame in Europe, or as part of a free DLC pack which was very briefly available in Japan. It has to be said that the XJ13 was reasonably well known before GT5, but I believe the way it was given equal spotlights with the Ford and Ferrari has elevated it beyond simply being a race car that never raced. For a while, Gran Turismo was the only game where this car could be driven, but it was also included in Forza Horizon 5's Car Pass back in January 2022. Still, we have to give credit to Gran Turismo for adding to a legend that sadly never was. Back in the days before Gran Turismo could get the likes of Ferrari or Lamborghini in their games, they had to get creative when it came to their high-performance exotic road cars. Of course, everyone knows about Roof being used as an alternative to Porsche, but you could also consider the Venturis of GT2 to be like a low-rent French Ferrari, or Vector as an American Lamborghini that was somehow even more erratic than the real thing. But with GT4, they managed to find an even better Lamborghini alternative, the Chisetta V16T. Announced in Los Angeles in 1988, the V16T was envisioned as a supercar that had never been seen before. The name V16T refers to its colossal V16 engine, which was made out of two Lamborghini Uraco V8s that were joined together with a single crankshaft. It's also quite well known that the design of the V16T was based on the original design of the Lamborghini Diablo by Marcello Gandini that went unused. However, this is only half true. The front end is based on Gandini's original drawings, but the rear was heavily modified, in part due to the transversely fitted V16. When it came to GT4, the Chisetta is often viewed as a bit of a pig to drive. You can win it from completing the Supercar Festival event, so it's fairly easy to get. But the irony is that once you've completed the Supercar Festival, you won't really have any use for it. Even then, it's not exactly the most competitive car if you go back and replay that event either. I have to say that from my own experience of driving it in GT4, the mockery of the V16T is a bit overblown. It certainly isn't great, but it's not terrible either. I mean, who would really expect a mid-90s 16-cylinder supercar built by a startup company to actually be good? Well, apparently in real life they were built to a very high standard, so maybe GT4 just doesn't do it justice. You will sometimes hear the Chisetta referred to as the Chisetta Moroder. This is because the V16T was originally conceived as a joint venture by Claudio Zampoli, whose name gives the initials Chisetta in Italian, and Giorgio Moroder, a former music producer who was most prominent in the 70s and 80s. Zampoli and Moroder fell out over a dispute surrounding the production of the car, which resulted in the two parting ways. As such, only the original prototype, Chassis 001 is badged as a Chisetta Moroder, with the subsequent 13 production models simply being known as Chisettas. The one featured in Gran Turismo is a 1994 model, most likely one of the handful of cars that were exported to Japan. So, in which game did we witness peak Chisetta? Something that's notable is that in each of the numbered games it's featured in, GT4, GT5, and GT6, the V16T has always been a prize car. Like I said, you could get it from the Supercar Festival in GT4, but also the A-Spec MR Sports Cup in GT5, and then for getting all golds on the fourth set of events at the Goodwood Festival of Speed in GT6. So with that said, I'm actually going to pick GT6 as my choice here. When talking about the previous cars on this list that were carried across from the PS2 era, they remained as standard PS2 models with just minor revisions. Although this was the case for the Chisetta in GT5, for GT6 it was actually fully remodelled into a premium car. 
And not only that, it was one of the 25 cars available in a special 15th anniversary edition livery that were given out for pre-ordering GT6 or buying the 15th anniversary edition, almost all of which being new premium cars in GT6. It's fair to say that the Chisetta got quite a lot of love in this game. It also received some pretty cool unique aero options. And I also feel like the handling was noticeably better, at least compared to GT4. Still not amazing, but certainly more usable. Anyway, to me, this all shows that by GT6, the Chisetta had transcended its original purpose as a Lamborghini alternative, and was now being appreciated for what it was in its own right. This point is further driven home by the fact that the Lamborghini Diablo road car made its debut in GT6. So it would have been all too easy for them to have left the Chisetta as a standard car, buried away in the 1200 strong car list, but I'm so glad they didn't. The fact that it received this unexpected premium update in GT6 has given people hope that it one day may return to the series. But even if it doesn't, there may be another, far more costly way to get your hands on one. You see, the Chisetta website is still up and running, with a page where you can leave your details to order a brand new V16T. Zampoli stated in an interview in 2018 that the V16T is still available, of course on special order only. But with his passing in 2021, it's unknown if this is still the case. The most recent Chisetta to be built was this convertible all the way back in 2003. So if you're watching this video and have a spare $800,000 lying around, why not head over to ChisettaAutomobile.com forward slash order and get in touch. If you're a fan of Gran Turismo or just cars in general, then I think it's only the right thing to do. The Group C prototypes of the 80s and early 90s were some of the most fearsome race cars that we have ever seen. It seemed like every major brand took a turn at developing their own, or at least outsourcing it to another company and then slapping their own engine in it. Through this, we witnessed the creation of some of the most iconic racing machines ever. Gran Turismo 4 was the game in which these types of cars became a major part of the series. In GT4, there were seven Group C prototypes in total, but if you were to ask most players, there would always be one that stood out from the rest. The Minolta Toyota 88 CV. Now, why was this? Well, there's quite a few reasons actually. The most obvious one being pure speed. This car is commonly seen as the outright fastest Group C prototype, and therefore the second fastest car in the entire game behind only the Formula GT. And not only are we talking about its pace over a single lap, but also top speed. The Minolta has over 900 horsepower out of the box, but can be tuned to over 1200 in GT4. This, combined with its aerodynamic properties, results in a car that is capable of in excess of 350 miles per hour. And that is faster than anything else in this game. So, there we are, the ultimate Group C prototype of GT4. But there is something very strange about the Minolta. To demonstrate this, what you're seeing is a selection of the Minolta's Group C rivals in GT4, and their numerous real-life accomplishments. Now let's take a look at the Minolta's. Yes, as many sports car history nerds like myself will be dying to tell you, in real life, the Minolta achieved the square root of nothing. So, let me explain why. Toyota had been around in Group C since pretty much the very beginning, but without a huge amount of success, other than a handful of wins in the domestic All Japan Sports Prototype Championship. For 1988, they developed a new car, the 88CV. Up until then, every Group C Toyota had been powered by an inline 4 engine, but the 88CV would instead be fitted with an all new 3.2 litre V8. Despite the name, the car was a completely new design which was separate from the standard 88C which also competed in 1988. 
If you look at the car's results, you will see that it had four entries across three races in 1988, with a best finish of just 16. From this, many would look and consider the car a complete failure, but that would be ignoring some very key details. In its first ever race, the Fuji 500 miles, the car qualified 7th, but soon made its way into the lead of the race. And it stayed there for some time, before a turbo problem caused it to lose speed and eventually retire. Still, it did manage the third fastest lap time of any car in the race, and even lasted longer than both the 88C and 87C, which were also present. If you ask me, that's not a bad showing for a completely brand new car. Later, at the Suzuka 1000 kilometers, the car would qualify third, and ran strongly in the top three for the early part of the race. Sadly, more engine troubles meant it lost considerable time, but it did still finish 16th and last of the classified finishers. The silver lining was that it was able to set the second fastest lap of the race. And then the car's final outing was at the Fuji 1000 kilometers. This time, two 88 CVs were entered, the usual number 36 Minolta car, but also the number 37 Taka Q sponsored machine. The number 37 qualified 16th, but the number 36 was 5th. This was especially impressive, given that the Fuji 1000 doubled as a round of the World Sports Prototype Championship. And so 5th place meant that they had managed to out-qualify even a handful of works cars from Jaguar and Sauber Mercedes. In the race, they unfortunately lacked pace and quickly dropped down, and further mechanical issues resulted in the number 36 finishing behind the number 37, in 22nd and 21st places respectively. Again, their single lap pace was solid, as was proven by the number 36 putting in the 6th fastest lap of the race despite their struggles. After this race, the 88CV was retired and replaced with the 89CV which evolved the same concept. So yes, the 88CV didn't achieve a whole lot, but you can see from its individual performances that the car was far from a no-hoper. It served more as a testbed for Toyota's new V8 than anything else. Sadly, it never raced at Le Mans, with the more proven four-cylinder 88C competing there instead. It showed immense one-lap speed, particularly at the power-sensitive Fuji Speedway, so maybe its depiction in GT4 isn't too far off the mark. Fortunately, Gran Turismo has never simulated reliability, which was the car's biggest weakness. I guess the question really is, why did Polyphony choose this car over the far more successful and well-known Toyota Group C cars? Surely something like the TS-010 or 94CV would have been more obvious choices, given that they both finished as runner-up at Le Mans. Even the 89CV managed to win a couple of races in Japan. No one can say for certain, but the most common theory is that the 88CV was chosen simply out of convenience. When a car is chosen to be included in Gran Turismo, a physical version of that car is usually needed for reference images, engine sound, and various other data. It's believed that the 88CV was chosen simply because it was easy to find and use for referencing, as opposed to any historical significance like with its contemporaries. In Gran Turismo, there are a couple of other interesting things about the Minolta. One is its name. The nickname Minolta, that I've been using throughout this video, is what the car is commonly referred to in the context of Gran Turismo. But did you know that this is what it was often called in real life? Just listen to some of the Japanese commentary from back when it raced. Minolta Toyota. Of course, Minolta is in reference to the car's titled sponsor, but this is likely why the car's official name in GT4 has its sponsor at the start rather than the manufacturer, something that is not true for most other race cars in this game. The other interesting point is the car's in-game year, 1989. Of course, the real 88CV was built and competed in 1988, so where did 89 come from? Was it simply a mistake? Well, the real reason is a little bit more complicated. 
When the car was retired and then put on display, a couple of the sponsor logos were changed to bring it in line with the 89 CV that was actually racing. The car in Gran Turismo is the one with the replaced sponsors, so it's actually depicting the car in its preserved state, hence it being labelled as a 1989 model instead of 1988. Alright, so the decision of which game represented Peak Minolta is a pretty obvious one. It's GT4. Aside from being one of, if not the fastest prototype, it is also one of the easiest to obtain in this game. All you have to do is win the El Capitan 200 miles endurance race. This event only requires a National A license and can be done with a reasonably fast road car, so the barriers to entry are quite low. The only real roadblock is that to unlock the endurance races, you do have to complete 25% of the game already. But trust me, it'll be worth it. Of course, the Minolta being so fast has the alternate effect of it being a really tough opponent. If it appears in the Gran Turismo World Championship, it will most likely be your biggest rival in terms of pure speed. However, in the hands of the AI, the car has marginally worse tyre wear than most of the other prototypes, meaning that at many tracks it has to do an extra pit stop. This fact means that despite its incredible speed, the Minolta often won't be your closest rival in the championship. As a player though, we can of course achieve a lot more with this car. Remember how I said the Minolta was second in speed only to the Formula GT? Well, in GT4 and also GT3, you can use any car you want to in the Formula GT World Championship. And, with the right driver, it's actually possible to beat the Formula GT cars with an upgraded Minolta. Now that's what I call asserting dominance. The car also appears in both GT5 and GT6, where it is still brutally fast. But the introduction of cars like the Red Bull X2010, and later the SRT Tomahawk, does kind of make the ranking of the fastest cars in those games completely trivial. In GT5, it is also given as a prize for completing the high speed like the wind event in A-Spec, which I think is very fitting. So there we are, the Minolta Toyota 88 CV. A car which was almost certainly destined to be a footnote in Group C history, but thanks to Gran Turismo has become one of the most beloved cars of the era. This, if anything, really highlights the power of these games to change people's perceptions of certain cars. Because even if it was never able to show its true potential on the racetrack, there's no doubt that we were able to witness it on the virtual ones instead. Many weird and wonderful cars have graced this series over the years, but the Chaparral 2J is one of them that needs no introduction. The story of it has gone down in racing folklore. Its unusual appearance, combined with an innovative design that featured a snowmobile engine powering two fans that effectively sucked the car to the track, was truly unforgettable. Unfortunately, the car itself wasn't able to achieve much success before being outlawed from the Can-Am series where it competed, but its design has gone on to influence countless more cars. Even current day Formula 1 machines can trace their ground effect aerodynamics back to the 2J. This car debuted in GT4, and right from the start it was always a fan favourite. Not only did it look like nothing else, but it was actually a shockingly good car that was capable of mixing it with the fastest prototypes. And yes, that does include even the mighty Minolta. One of its best features was its traction out of corners, as it had far less wheel spin than most of its rivals, and this allowed it to have really good tyre life also. The car was equally as impressive in GT5 and GT6, and then it reappeared in GT7. Initially it was quite a handful in this game, but as updates improved the handling model, the 2J just became better and better, until today where it stands once again as a very solid race car. In the right hands, it can mix it with the prototypes just like in the older games. But it would be completely wrong to say that Gran Turismo made the 2J famous. The 2J being the way it is made the 2J famous. Gran Turismo merely exposed it to a wider audience. But within the Chaparral dealership, you'll find another car which I think fits that description far better. The Chaparral 2D. 
Most know the 2D as the other Chaparral in Gran Turismo, but I'm here to tell you that it too has a fascinating story, and one that is told far less often. Chaparral itself was founded as a constructor in 1962, and competed in various sports car races across North America. For 1966, they decided that they would build a car to the International Group 6 regulations. This was the 2D, and it was actually Chaparral's first ever closed cockpit car. Making the car comply to Group 6 regs meant that it could be entered in major endurance races across the globe. Almost immediately, the car showed speed, qualifying second for the Daytona 24 hours. Sadly, reliability would be a problem, with the car failing to finish, and the same would be true in the following race at Sebring, where two cars were entered. But then came the Nürburgring 1000km. Again, the 2D qualified second, behind only a works Ferrari 330p3. But it would be the Ferrari that suffered mechanical troubles and retired, paving the way for the 2D to take the chequered flag after roughly seven hours of racing. This was not only Chaparral's first major endurance win, but also their first international win, and all at no lesser circuit than the fearsome Nürburgring. This alone marks the 2D as one of Chaparral's most important race cars, and one of only two of their cars to win an international endurance race, the other being its successor, the 2F, which won at Brands Hatch the following year. In its seven starts, the only time the 2D reached the finish was at the Nürburgring. The car did compete at Le Mans in 1966, where it qualified a respectable 10th, and as the only non-Ford or Ferrari in the top 20, and was briefly used at the start of 1967, before being replaced with the 2F. In Gran Turismo, the car appeared alongside the 2J in GT4 through 6, but its peak had to be its debut game. Something that you could find in the older GT games is this type of environmental storytelling which I like to call event storytelling. The basic idea is that in some in-game events, through the details of the events like the tracks, the opponent cars, and the prize car given, the game is taking influence from real life and referencing that in the event itself. I think the Chaparral 2D has one of the best examples of this. So in GT4, there are two endurance races taking place at the Nürburgring, the 4-hour and the 24-hour. The 4-hour is intended for road cars, however your prize for winning it is, guess who, the Chaparral 2D. At least in the international versions of the game, because fun fact, Chaparral was not included on the original Japanese version of GT4. But then, in the 24-hour race, you may encounter the 2D as one of the opponents, in which case it will be easily your toughest rival. We can now see how they're referencing the car's real-life history in a very subtle and interesting way. Sadly, this level of subtlety has fallen out of favour in recent games, with a far more direct approach taken instead, but these types of sly references are the sort of things that really made me love Gran Turismo in the first place. For me personally, the Chaparral 2D is one of the cars that I wish was made premium in the PS3 era the most. It would have fit perfectly with the aforementioned Big 3 from Ferrari, Ford, and Jaguar, and not to mention that it was absolutely beautiful to look at. Of course, it's still featured as a standard car, but it was merely shunted into used car dealership obscurity. It was no longer a prize car, and had its price inflated from 1.1 million credits in GT4 to 12.2 million in GT5. Weirdly, it then came back down to 3.7 million in GT6, so that's something. Funnily enough, the 2D shares quite a few similarities with the Minolta when it comes to its real-life racing exploits, with the exception of that one big win at the Nürburgring. So it's not at all surprising that the 2D has been overlooked in favour of the far more radical 2J. In GT4, they cost almost the same amount, so why would anyone pick the 2D? But whilst it doesn't have the same wow factor as the 2J, or many of Chaparral's other race cars, the 2D is arguably the most important car they ever made. This was the car that put Chaparral on the map. 
So without it, Chaparral as a brand may never have featured in Gran Turismo at all. So if you like the 2J, but have pretty much all but forgotten the 2D, you can still appreciate what this car achieved and what it made possible for one of the most influential racing teams of the 20th century. For the sake of this video, I've tried to avoid mentioning any concept cars. The reason for this is that concept cars are supposed to be forgotten almost by design. As such, when a concept car is featured in Gran Turismo, something which has happened many times, it's always a pretty familiar story. But for this last entry, I'll be making an exception. That's because the story of this concept car and how it made its way into Gran Turismo is really fascinating. Take your minds back to the Tokyo Game Show in September of 2010. Anticipation was building for the imminent release of Gran Turismo 5 in November, but there was still plenty of details to be revealed. It was here where a few of the social features under the Community tab were announced, but there were also a few new cars shown off too. The GT by Citroen race car was seen for the first time, and so were the German World War II vehicles, the Volkswagen Kubelwagen and Schwimmwagen. This was already a pretty interesting mixture of vehicles, but it was about to get even stranger. This is the Isuzu 4200R. Making its video game debut, the 4200R was a concept shown off by Isuzu at the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show. It was a four-door mid-engine sports car powered by a Lotus-derived 4.2-litre V8. But despite all of that, its most striking feature had to be its styling. It was a very flowing design that looked nothing like what Isuzu had produced before. Take the boxy Piazza and Gemini, for example. It seemed to be an indication of Isuzu's future design direction. But despite the calls from many to put the car into production, it sadly never was. But worse was yet to come. In 1993, it was decided that Isuzu would focus solely on SUVs and commercial vehicles. Not seeing any reason to keep it around, the 4200R was destroyed, never to be seen again. After that, all we had to remember the car by were the handful of images taken when it still existed. But now fast forward to 2009. Kazunori Yamauchi was attending the Pebble Beach Concourse, where he would be part of the judging panel. In addition to this, he would be handing out the Gran Turismo Award for a particular vehicle that he saw as exceptional, a tradition that began the previous year. In the end, he chose an Alfa Romeo Giulia TZ2 as the winner, and this car would go on to be immortalised in Gran Turismo the following year. But that wasn't the only car that would end up in GT5 as a result of him attending the show. Another judge of the event was Shiro Nakamura, the then Chief Creative Officer at Nissan. As it turns out, Nakamura had previously worked at Isuzu and was heavily involved in the design of the 4200R. Coincidentally, Kaz himself was present at the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show and saw the car in person. As they discussed this, they soon came to an idea. Why not bring the 4200R back to life by featuring it in Gran Turismo? And so it was decided. Using solely reference images, and with Nakamura himself watching over the process, the 4200R was successfully reborn in GT5. By the way, Shiro Nakamura retired in 2017, but he actually appears in GT7 as one of the designers you'll find at the cafe, who lends his thoughts about certain cars. The 4200R is a very unique concept car in Gran Turismo. It is one of the only concept cars that was added to the game long after the real thing had first been shown. One of the few other examples of this is with the Mitsubishi HSR2, which debuted in GT4, and coincidentally, was also first seen at the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show. So that's the whole convoluted story, but if I'm being honest, the 4200R in Gran Turismo is a bit of a disappointment. From that big V8, it only makes 300 horsepower, and yet it weighs 1500 kilos. The performance isn't terrible, it's just that from looking at it, you would expect a bit more. 
But still, it's amazing that this car even featured in Gran Turismo at all. As for its peak game, there isn't much to choose between GT5 and GT6, but I'll go with the former. The car is given out for getting all golds on the A license, which adds a bit of reverence to it, but aside from that, it doesn't feature too heavily in the main career. It's worth mentioning that Isuzu created an even more outlandish concept a couple of years later, known as the Isuzu Como. It was a pickup truck slash ute style thing that had a similar design language to the 4200R. It was also powered by a Formula 1 V12 that had been tested by Team Lotus. Yes, really. Sadly, in spite of its cool backstory and incredible looks, the 4200R is kind of forgettable in these games. But even still, through this car, the power of Gran Turismo has been shown once again. Not only can it launch cars into stardom, but it can even bring them back from the dead. And that brings us to the end of another chapter of memorable Gran Turismo cars. You might have been able to tell, but some of these cars I've wanted to talk about for a very long time, and I'm glad that I finally got the opportunity to do so. With that said, there are still more cars from this series that I feel are worth highlighting. So, let me know in the comments what type of cars you want me to cover in future videos, and I may just do so. But for now, thanks for watching, and have a good one.